Good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Doing good? Man, we are so excited for this service today. So glad that you're with us. Again, as Susie mentioned earlier, my, my name's Mike. My wife Susie and I are the lead pastors here at Mohawk Valley Church. If you're visiting, you're our guest. Man, I just want to encourage you, fill that Connect card out. Take that card to the hub and get your free gift. And I want to invite you to come back next week. We're in the, mis- in the middle of this series called Relationship Rehab, where we're looking at our relationships. Now, how many people know that if you're in a relationship, chances are you're going to get offended at some point? Like, you've said something, someone has said something to you that it's offended you, all right? We all have gotten offended before, but how do we deal with that offense? Next week, we're going to be talking about how do we deal with offense when it comes to our relationships. And we started this series a few weeks ago. Last week, we talked about family matters. And we heard from um, Bree, our kids' director, Pastor Caleb, uh, Pastor Susie, myself. And we just really talked about, man, the importance of family And then two weeks ago, we kicked off the series, Susie and I preached, talking about how marriage matters and what that looks like. How do we have godly marriages? Excuse me. Today, I want to talk to you about rehabbing your relationship with Jesus. And the title of my message is Jesus Matters, that Jesus matters. And we've been using this illustration, kind of renovating a space or a room in your house, and how do you build and grow your relationships? Now, maybe you're here and you've been a a Christian for a long time. Or maybe you're new to the faith, or maybe you're here because someone invited you and said, hey, I'm getting baptized, can you come? And you would say, you know what, I really don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want you to know that this message is for all of the above today. And here's the thing, it might feel a little intimidating working on something that you haven't touched in a while. Or maybe you've kind of dabbled a little bit over the past few months or years and trying to grow your faith, but just kind of, you know, dabbled in it a little bit here and a little bit there. Well, I want to challenge you today that Jesus matters. And don't be intimidated uh, because it's been a while. Don't be intimidated because, you know what, maybe I haven't put the time and the effort into my relationship that I should. Um, I, I'm, I'm believing that this message is going to speak to you and help you take that next step in your faith. Now, I think we're all at this point dreaming of those 60 degree weather days again. Yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of dreaming of that. Um, being outside, enjoying the sun, <clears throat> maybe doing some work outside. Because you're like, I just shoveled my driveway. That wasn't fun. Uh, I talked to someone in the foyer. It's like, I had to shovel three times in the last two days. And, and we're just dreaming of those nice sunny days. Well, a few years ago, I decided that the spring that I was going to build a fence. Uh, not just any fence, I was going to build this um, privacy fence. And so uh, I was kind of looking at it and deciding, okay, what am I going to do? Um, how am I going to build this? And uh, I got actually a couple quotes from some construction companies. And when I saw how much it was going to be, I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. I'm not, I'm, I can't. I can't in good conscience pay someone to do something that I know I can do myself. But it had been a while. You know, uh, for most people know, my dad was a contractor, and I worked for a couple contracting companies um, many years ago. But it had been quite a while since I'd built something to this size. It was going to be about 8 feet high and about 32 feet long. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it myself and and get the materials. So... I was going to make um, uh, cedar slats, and so there'd be these pieces um, every, you know, eighth inch or so. And, and so uh, the, the fastest and the best way to do it was going to be to paint, or not paint, um, stain the cedar. Because the cedar, if you just put it on, will gray over, like, the, the first summer, summer one, it looks great. Then the next summer, it's all gray. And so if you want it to keep that nice, rich color, then you got to stain it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to stain it. So I set up all these pieces of cedar. There was like a couple hundred, easily, that I needed. And, and set them up in my garage and begin staining them. And I'd be in the garage for hours, like staining all, you know, three sides of it, making sure it's done right. And, and, uh, and so I was spending all this time in the garage staining, and Susie would go out back and look at where the fence is supposed to be, and be like, nothing's happening. Like, here he is spending hours in the garage, right, working on it, but nothing's out. Like, nothing, but it was the preparation. It, it was preparing for the work that needed to be done. 
Well, you know there's preparation that needs to be done with your faith. There's some preparation that needs to happen when it comes to your faith. And I look at the preparation as decisions. Man, we all make decisions in this life for various different reasons, but preparation is going to um, really be the decision part of our faith, deciding that I'm going to make faith a priority, that I want a deeper relationship with Jesus. It's a decision that I'm going to live my life according to God's word, a decision that I'm going to attend church regularly with me, my family, and my kids. See, all these are predetermined decisions that I'm going to make with no one else seeing it. No one else seeing those decisions that you need to decide in your mind and in your heart that I want something more. I want something different for me and for my family. And it's going to be the prep work that no one sees that's going to make all the difference. It's a decision that Jesus matters. See, Joshua chapter 24, verse, first, uh, verse 15 says this. It says, but for as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a decision that, you know what, me and my house, that we are going to put God first. We are going to serve the Lord. You see, your kids are not going to grow up and faithfully serve Jesus on accident. No, it's going to take parents making a conscious decisions in how you raise your kids. You're not going to have a godly marriage on accident, a home full of peace on accident. It's going to require you to first make a decision that Jesus matters in my life and that I'm going to do the work necessary so that I have a relationship, a deep relationship, and that I can enjoy um, a godly marriage, a home full of peace. But I'm going to be honest that's the easiest part. The prep work is really the, the easiest part. The decision, making the decision ahead of time, it's the easiest part, right? We just came out of um, New Year's, right? And usually, you know, the kind of the end of December, beginning of January, everyone's like, oh, I'm going to uh, be so healthy in 2024. I'm going to eat better. I'm not going to go and reach for that second, third, fourth cookie. Like, I, I'm going to eat. I'm going to be so healthy. And you make this decision, and you feel really good. But then at some point, it's going to require some action. <laughs> like, at some point, you're going to have to say no to the cookies and yes to the baby carrots. Right? It's going to require some, some work. Uh, let me tell you, when I was building this fence, the staining of these was the easiest part. <laughs> After I was done staining them, then began the hard part of digging the post holes. And if you've ever um, made a, um, built a fence and you've put anything in the ground, um, whoa, that was big. And it, it requires, if you don't want it to be, you know, wrecked in a year or two, you have to put the posts down four feet. You need to get it below the frost line. And I was actually, you know, when I had a couple of contractors come over and give me some estimates, one of them said, oh, yeah, we just put the post two feet under. I'm like, all right, you just leave now because you clearly don't know what you're doing. I mean, my, my dad was a contractor, built custom homes my whole life up in Canada. And he was like, you know, what, listen, if you don't want the frost to ruin your fence, because the fence, because when it frosts and then it thaws, frost, thaw, it, what it does, it upheaves the, um, the fence post. And so you need to get the, the cement down below the frost line, which in Canada is four feet. Here it's probably around three, three and a half. But four feet, you're safe. So I was like, all right, I need to start digging these fence posts. And I'm starting digging these holes, digging these holes. And the first two feet, I'm like, oh, this isn't bad. And then, the, then like third foot, I'm like, oh. Now like the last foot from foot three to foot four takes like twice as long as the first three feet. And you're like, you know, digging out there. My hands are getting all, you know, I'm calloused. And it's just, it's hard work. It, it, it hard work. And then once you're done that, then you move on to the fun part, mixing cement. <laughs> Like, it's, it's, it's more hard work. You're like mixing cement so you can put the four by fours in the hole, cement it so your fence post and your fence stays, doesn't go anywhere. Well, at some point in your faith, it's going to require some action. It's going to require some work on your part so that you can grow. And you need to take action. You're going to have to take action in your life. And there's a few things that you could take action with. Number one is developing a prayer life. 
developing a prayer life, you, if you want to rehab and grow and develop your relationship with Jesus, man, you need to pray. And here's the thing, is praying is simply talking to Jesus. Voicing your needs, your desires, your fears, your failures. Confessing your sin. Asking him to protect your family. Asking the Holy Spirit to lead you and to guide you. And here's the thing, don't get caught up in all the words. It's just a relationship. It's just a, a conversation between you and the Lord. And it could just be simply, Lord, Lord, protect my, my kids as they go to school. Lord, protect me as I go to work. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me discernment. Give me patience in Jesus' name. Like, as I go to work and I have to work, I'm working with that certain coworker that just drives me nuts. I know we're on the same shift together. Lord, give me some patience. And, and so it's just this conversation that happens. And, and I think too often Christians get maybe intimidated. They, they hear somebody pray. And like, man, I can never pray like that. And, and, and you're like, you kind of read through the Bible and just like, I don't know. It just kind of intimidates me. Don't be intimidated. It's just this conversation that you have with Jesus. You don't have to use these big, long, fancy words. In fact, Jesus actually kind of spoke out against that, said, listen, don't pray like the Pharisees standing up in front of everybody and use these big, long, drawn-out sentences and words. Like, it's just this conversation between you and the Lord. And don't make it any more complicated than it needs to be, but you're going to have to make time you have to set aside some time in your day that says, you know, hey, at this moment, this time, I'm going to spend with the Lord. I'm going I'm I'm to spend talking to Jesus. I'm going to spend in prayer. It might be early in the morning. It might be late at night. It might be on your drive to work or home, whatever, wherever it is and happens. It's going to require some action on your part. Next, again, if you want to grow and develop your relationship with Jesus, man, you're going to have to get into your word. You, you need to read God's word because his word is truth. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 119, verse 11, it says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's saying store up your word in your heart. Why? why? Why do we need to read God's word? Well, Psalm says, so that you won't sin, so that you know the truth, so that you know how to live, so that when you read God's word, it kind of lays out, hey, this is how we ought to live. These are the things that we you know, need to stay away from. These are the things that we should gravitate towards. When you store it up in your heart, so that you won't sin against me, the Bible says. You know, we're seeing the decay and eroding of godly principles in our country because people don't know God's word. Because they don't know God's word. And here's the thing is God's word is truth. It is the absolute truth. And the problem with society and our culture is it thinks that truth can change based upon an emotion or a feeling. And that is just completely false. The world wants so badly for there to be no absolute truth. Because if there's no absolute truth, then you can live however you want. But when you know and believe that, hey, there is absolute truth all of a sudden, then there's consequences for your actions. See, without absolute truth, we have no order. Without absolute truth, we have no morality. We have no consequences. Without absolute truth, people can just live how they want. And that's why culture and society are telling you, well, it's just your truth. It's just, you, you believe that. They're like, oh, that's great for you. That, that's your truth. No, no, it's the truth. <laughs> like, this isn't a truth. This isn't one of many truths. This is the truth. The one and only truth. But world and society wants you to believe that however you feel, whatever emotion you might be feeling on any particular day, on any particular hour, in any particular minute, can be your truth. That's just simply not true. This is God's word, and it is the absolute truth. And you need to read and get God's word into your heart, because Jesus tells us in John chapter 8, verse 31, he says, if you abide in my word. How do we abide in his word? Well, we have to know it. That's how we abide in his word, when we know the word. Then he says, then you truly are my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
It's the truth of God that will set you free. I am wholeheartedly believe in grace and forgiveness and in second chances. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. But I also believe that we serve a just and righteous God and that we are going to preach the truth that we are all sinners and we have all fallen short of the glory of God and there's only one way to heaven. That's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? So we need to know the truth. We need to get the truth of God's word in our heart. And if you want to grow and develop and, and, and make 2024 and beyond um, uh, uh, a faith, a priority, man, Jesus matters. And you need to attend church regularly. The writer of Hebrews, it tells us this in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. He says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and in all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer is telling us, hey, there's some people, um, some believers or Christians that are getting in the habit of not meeting together. Don't do that, he says. Because you need to stir up one another in love and good works. Like, like, you need to encourage one another. You need to be there for one another. And he says, but encouraging one another, um, he also says that we need to encourage one another. Like, when the body of Christ comes together like this, you encourage one another. You stir each other up, Hebrews says, in love and in works. Now, we all get sick. We all go on vacations. We all, I mean, no one's, I don't expect anybody to be here 52 to 52 weeks. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is make it a regular part of your life. Because, man, your kids, let me tell you, they, they need to foster godly relationships. Your teenagers, they, they need to have godly relationships with other students that, that love God, that, that, that are making faith a priority. And when you attend church regularly, you build relationships with one another. Obviously, our first and foremost, most important relationship is with God. But we also need relationship with one another. The Bible says that the iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Man, we need each other, church. We need each other to stir each other, to spur each other on, to, to sharpen one another. Make attending church a priority. And the last thing that we need to do to grow in our relationship as we develop a prayer life, as we get the truth of God's word, as we attend church regularly, we need to resist sin. We need to resist sin. The Bible tells us that sin separates us from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. When you're trying to foster and develop a relationship with Jesus, you want to avoid the very thing that's going to separate you from him, and that's sin. Yes, God will forgive you. Yes, he's a God of second chances. Yes, he's a God of grace. So that when you do mess up, you do slip, you do fall, you do make a mistake, yes, he will forgive you, absolutely. But Paul also tells us that just because we have grace it doesn't mean that we just keep on sinning. No, once, once we, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of turns, you make that decision, and the Holy Spirit kind of, you know, pricks your heart, and you're like, mm, I shouldn't have done that. You pray, say, God, forgive me. I messed up. I shouldn't have said that. I got angry. I blew up at my kids, my wife, my husband. My, I shouldn't have done that. Forgive me. But then what happens is the next time, the next time that you feel like that anger stir up, what you need to do is to resist. Yes, there is grace when you make a mistake, but at some point, you need to be able to resist. And that when that temptation comes, say, no, I made that mistake before, and I don't want to do it again. Resisting sin is being able to say no when temptation comes. See, these, these things that we build, that help us build and develop a strong relationship with Jesus, pray. It's talking to God. Getting in God's word to learn about who he is. The church, it helps equip you, inserts you into the body of Christ, and then sin, it separates you from God, so we need to resist sin. Worship team, you can go ahead and come back. But the last thing, the love, your faith journey, if you will, and the last part of building my fence 
was the fruit of your labor. And let me tell you, the last part of putting up this fence was the easiest part. And once the posts were in, the pieces were painted or stained, it, was, it went up really quick. I was like, you know, I had all these pieces. It was like, bang, I, I needed Susie would help me for a little bit, and my girls would help me. Like, just hold the other end. And it was like, bang, bang, bang. You can kind of see a little bit. It's kind of blurry. <laughs> and it just went up so quickly. But I was enjoying the fruits of my labor. I'd already dug the holes, mixed the cement, set the posts. I'd already painted the pieces. Now I was just able to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And man, the fence just went up so quickly. It was like, boom, 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 a couple hours. It was done. But it's because I'd already put the hard work in. Let me tell you today, some of you are going to experience the fruit of your labor by having a spiritual mountaintop experience of when you're getting baptized. Like, like that's a great next step of your faith is being baptized. That's the fruit of your labor. Taking that next step. But there's all, also other fruits of your labor. Fruits like a home full of peace. When you get in God's word, you have a prayer life, you attend church, and, and you do that on a consistent basis, and eventually you're going to have a home full of peace. You're going to have less stress and anxiety. You're going to have faith when adversity comes instead of fear. You're going to have a strong, godly marriage, respectful kids. These are just some of the fruits of your labor that you can experience when you decide to take the necessary steps to make Jesus matter in your life today. Jesus matters. And there's just something powerful when we make a declaration, when we make a decision. It starts with the prep work, a decision. Jesus, you are going to be important in my life. Then it's going to require some action. But then, at some point along the journey, you're going to enjoy the fruit of your labor. And today, uh, as we're going to be getting ready in just a few moments to baptize some people, man, it's the fruit of your labor. You've already made the decision in your heart. You've already done the work. And now, it's that next step, proclaiming who Jesus is in your life. Susie is going to go ahead and, and finish the message today. I want to share with you just a few things about what baptism, baptism is and what it isn't. So baptism is not the way we get saved. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation is first. It's the most important yes. It is the most important decision that you will ever make is when you say yes to the Lord. And everyone that's getting baptized today, they are because they made that decision. And now they're following in the example that Jesus gave us. Matthew, 5, Matthew 3, 13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. Jesus was baptized as an adult. Not as a baby, but as an adult. Why? Because in order to be baptized in water, you have to be old enough to make that decision to say, I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. It's an outward profession. It's an outward demonstration of what Jesus has done inside of you. And man, as Mike was sharing today about putting up that fence, about building that fence, maybe what you couldn't see from the picture is that when he first set the poles in the cement, he couldn't just leave them that way. No, he had to brace the poles. At the back of the fence, there were two by fours. So the wall was right here and there were two by fours that came down like this, bracing the posts, bracing the wall so it could set in cement. Maybe you've tried to make the decision to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you've prayed the prayer of salvation, but the storms came and the winds blew and this life that you were trying to build for Jesus, it fell. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Pastor Susie, I tried that. I tried to give my life to God. I tried to make those decisions. I tried to rehab my relationship with Jesus, but guess what? It didn't work. It didn't stick. Let me tell you the difference that it makes. The people that are getting baptized today 
one of the reasons that they're able to stand and to say, for the rest of my life, I'm gonna live for Jesus, it's because they have the people of God surrounding them in this place, bracing them up, holding them up, saying, the wind is gonna blow in your life, amen? The storms are gonna come, the hard times are gonna come, but guess what? You don't have to do it alone. Because as a church, we are going to brace you. We are going to stand with you. We are going to hold you up. We are going to cheer you on. And so in just a moment, our baptism candidates are going to come forward. But before they do, I want to take a moment to ask you, do you need to make the decision today to say yes to Jesus. If you could close your eyes all across this place, this is a moment that counts. Maybe you came here to support someone else and now all of a sudden you feel your heart is racing. You feel the Holy Spirit touching your life and you would say, Pastor Susie, today I want to make the decision to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you've made it in the past. Maybe this is your very first time. It doesn't matter. What matters is that today you say yes. I promise you it's the best yes you'll ever make. On the count of three, with no one looking, every eye closed, if that's you today, and you would say, Pastor Susie, I wanna say yes to Jesus. On the count of three, I just want you to slip a hand in the air so I can pray for you. One, two, three. Hands are already going up in this place, all across. God, so incredible. Just keep your hand lifted up. Would you just repeat this prayer? I want everyone in this room to just, pr just pray after me. Dear Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are God and that I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sins and help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can put your hand down this morning. Can we just give it up for everyone this morning? Man. There had to have been 15, 20 hands that were up this morning. Let me tell you, if you made that decision, if you made that decision this morning to give your life to Jesus, you are not alone. We want to be with you. We want to cheer you on. We want to support you in your faith. And everything that Mike talked about today, it's just the beginning. We believe that truly the best is yet to come for you. We just want to be with you and partner with you along this way. Right now, I want to invite...